Okay. So uh, when we uh, uh, ended uh, last time was um, in strengthening mechanisms in, um, in Bainite and Martensite, and we just said um, that uh, so in Martensite, the uh, main strengthening mechanisms, contribution to strengthening are um, to carbon in solid solution, the lath size, uh, and the dislocation density. And those are the main um, uh, strengthening mechanisms. Um, but the, the most important one is the, uh, the solute carbon content. In bainite, um, which is relatively similar to uh, martensite, with this big difference, large difference, that the, the carbon is not in solute solution, but in, um, in um, present as precipitate, as cementite particles, um, we, we don't have this big uh, effect of the, the solute uh, carbon uh, content. And the same holds, of course, for tempered martensite, where uh, the two uh, main hardening mechanisms Three, I should say, is the the, uh, the precipitation hardening by the carbides. So in in, in tempered martensite and bainite, you have the, the carbides that do give precipitation hardening. A dislocation density, which is uh, mainly coming not from plastic deformation, for, but from the transformation um, uh, reaction, and uh, the what I would call the, the structural. Uh, unit size, for instance, the lat size in the Martin side, which is a submicron um, thickness. Good. So um, we now try to um, say a few things about um, how these uh, you know, strengthening properties are, are measured, uh, or uh, strengthening and, and, and plasticity properties are, are measured in practice. And uh, the most important way of, to represent them is via um, uh, stress strain curves that you obtain in uh, tensile tests. Um, and um, the result of uh, a tensile test, which are basically load displacement or load uh, uh, force uh, versus um, uh, so the displacement as measured by a strain gauge. Um, uh, is, is transformed into stress versus strain uh, equations and uh, stress versus strain data, excuse me. And then this is fitted to, um, to empirical equations. So anytime you uh, kind of report um, uh, stress strain data or, or uh, parameters derived from stress strain data, you, you should also say, you know, what, what is the empirical fitting equation that you have used? And um, the four more important ones are the Holomon equation, yes, which is which has two parameters: this parameter a and the exponent n. And the exponent is the strain hardening exponent. Um, then you have the Ludwig a equation, which um, well looks very much like the the Holomon equation except that you can see that there is a, an additional parameter y, which is the yield strength. Mm -hmm. And then a, um, the, um, the, uh, the exponent applies only to the plastic strain. Mm -hmm. The Swift equation is, um, uh, looks very much like the Ludwig equation, but, but again, it's not exactly the same. Here you have, um, uh, so it's a, it's a constant. So it pretty much looks like the the Holloman a combination of Holloman and, and Ludwig approaches. And finally, you have the Voigt uh, uh, empirical equation, which is a little bit complex, which is um, which has the uh, the plastic strain in uh, this uh, exponential function. Um, in the case of the Holloman equation, the Ludwig equation, and the Swift equation, the, the strain hardening, this N, this strain hardening exponent, is assumed to be uh, a constant. Mm 
it is not in practice a constant, it's strain dependent. And um, the Voce equation is, is uh, the only one of these four that uh, can actually uh, take this into account. Hmm? All right, so this is an example here of, um, for instance, what the effect is of this B parameter in the Swift constitutive equation on the stress strain curves. You don't see much in uh, the plot as you plot the true strain versus true strain. But um, at small strains, there is an effect of this increasing B value. Hmm? Um, the uh, uh, Swift equation, the same Swift equation, yeah, if you compare it with the Voce equation, yes, um, uh, shows that in the case of the, the Swift equation, your N value is constant. Whereas in the case of the, the Voch equation, you can have a, uh, a strain dependent value for the strain uh, hardening exponent. And that is actually much uh, closer to reality hmm, than uh, the, uh, the situation uh, implied by the uh, Swift equation. Hmm? The uh, uh, stress strain. Uh, curves of engineering, uh, uh, engineering stress strain curves of uh, steels um, uh, can be uh, often have as a consequence of aging this uh, plateau, uh, yield, what we call yield plateau, you know, um, uh, at, uh, when, when the uh, yielding is initiated, or can have a continuous. Uh, yielding uh, behavior. Now, um, when we have uh, a yield plateau, the uh, the boundary between the uh, uh, plasticity, plastic behavior, and elastic behavior is very well defined. Hmm? So, if we have, if we look at uh, stress strain curves with um, with a, a clear yield point, this would be the stress strain curve. So it's perfectly elastic up to this point here. Yes. And then we reach the yield plateau. The material uh, plastically deforms. Right. Uh, uh, prior to this strain here, there is no plastic deformation. Basically, all the dislocations are uh, pinned. Yes. And um, there is no uh, plastic deformation. When you have, uh, however, um, a continuous yielding, it is difficult to say, to define at what moment, at what strain, the, uh, the, the, the plasticity starts. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have a region of what we call microplasticity, a region where the dislocations will move uh, irreversibly. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so, so in engineering practice, what you do, uh, this would be here, this, this curve that I'm uh, drawing here, would be the stress strain curve for a, a steel that uh, has a continuous uh, yielding behavior. In that case, we choose the so-called proportional limit or the, um, the uh, stress at the strain of 0.2%, so 0.002 strain, um, as the elastic, uh, uh, as the yield strength, as the elastic limit. Um, but in practice, in, in reality, before that, you can already see that uh, there is a, a, an appreciable deviation from the uh, elastic uh, stress strain behavior. And that particular region, uh, before the uh, so-called so conventional yielding uh, uh, point, is a region of microplasticity. So in that region, you actually do have irreversible motion of dislocations. Important, uh, again, uh, to realize that uh, there is a difference between engineering uh, stress strain curves and 
true stress strain curves, yes. In engineering practice, we do use engineering uh, stress strain curves. What we assume in this case is that uh, uh, the, uh, the cross section, you know, this, this, the cross section does not vary, uh, of the sample does not vary uh, during uh, the test. And um, as, as a consequence, you get uh, a stress strain curve which uh, has this maximum here, yes. Um, it, however, we know that that's not the case, that as we strain the material, it, we, in a tensile test, we make it longer, so the section will necessarily be strain dependent, yes. Um, uh, so we, um, we can determine the uh, true stress, true strain curve, hmm? um, where instead of, uh, in the case of engineering strain, we use the uh, elongation, the increase in length divided by the original length, uh, the true strain is actually the natural logarithm of the ratio of the uh, length divided by the original length, hmm? the uh, instantaneous length divided by the uh, starting length. Hmm? So one important uh, thing is, uh, is that we get this maximum here in the engineering stress strain curve. Hmm? And prior to the, uh, this uh, maximum, our strain is uniform, yes? There is a uniform elongation. Hmm? That means, what does that mean? There is no uh, local plastic deformation. The deformation is homogeneously distributed across the length of the specimen. Uh, as soon as we reach the beyond this maximum, uh, we the specimen is starting to neck. I mean, there is a local uh, a ch a change in uh, a localized uh, cross-sectional change. Yes? Uh, um, Good. If you if you plot the the same data now in um, stress strain um, true stress true strain uh, curve, this maximum disappears. Yes, and uh, you can find uh, the uh, 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 boundary between uniform and post uniform elongation is not so it's not so visible, and you need to apply what's called the uh, um, consider criteria. Hmm? It's very uh, simple by uh, uh, applying these uh, two equations that are in the box here below uh, to, to go from engineering stress strain curve to um, true stress, true strain curve. Hmm? Okay, so what does this uh, 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 consider criterion say? say is that uh, in a true stress, uh, true strain uh, 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 diagram, the uh, point of uh, where you uh, reach the end of the uniform elongation is given by the point where the stress, yes, is, or the strain at which the stress is equal to the strain hardening, the derivative of the stress to the, um, to the strain. So it, if you want to know the uniform elongation in, excuse me, in this uh, particular plot here, and this is true strain stress plot, uh, you will of course not see it as a maximum, but if you take then the derivative of the same curve, look up the point where they cross, that will be your uniform elongation. So, um, this, um, the uh, graph here also illustrates a very in interesting point, is that contrary to what um, a lot of us uh, uh, learn in uh, elementary uh, or introductory courses on material science, mechanics of materials, that uh, stronger materials are, uh, have less plasticity Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily the case. And this is an example here in particular for steels, where we compare the strength and the uniform elongation of a 
high strength IF steel and a so called trip steel. And you can see that a uniform elongation of the high strength steel is about 20%. Yeah? The trip steel has a uniform elongation which is uh, higher, but uh, no, more than about 5% higher. And a, uh, despite the fact that the strength is almost double. Yeah? And the reason why this is possible is because the strain hardening because the strain hardening is uh, larger for the trip steel than it is for the high strength steel. So it is possible to achieve both higher strength and uh, still have a very good plastic uh, uh, deformation uh, or formability characteristics in a steel uh, as long as you manage to increase uh, not only the strength but also the uh, strain hardening. And we'll see how these uh, trip steels are, are made in practice. Um, word of caution here. Mm, strain curves uh, uh, or mechanical uh, properties are always uh, dependent on uh, are dependent on the way you measure these properties. And so uh, whenever you uh, uh, report uh, data, or uh, on um, mechanical properties of steel, you should always uh, tell the reader um, what kind of uh, specimens, geometries you've used. Hmm? And these are some, these uh, uh, three examples here are commonly used to test uh, the mechanical properties of steels um, in um, sheet steels. And so, um, so these are not round uh, samples, they're flat um, uh, samples. And you can see that there is considerable uh, difference in the geometry of these specimens. Uh, and as a consequence, there may be also differences in the, the, the properties that are, that are reported. So important to uh, uh, always uh, mention, uh, well, first of all, always important to use standard uh, methods to determine stress drinkers and then uh, when reporting the data always indicate which uh, type of specimen was used. Um, steels have been uh, studied for a long time, so there is plenty of information out there uh, telling us um, what the stress strain uh, curve of steel uh, can look like uh, depending on uh, basic uh, properties of that steel, which would be, for instance, uh, basic property with the composition, the grain size. For instance. And uh, so in this table here, for instance, um, the, uh, there are three parameters in this um, uh, equation here, the Swift equation. Um, and a parameter should be small a, a small b parameter, and this uh, n, the strain hardening. Yes. And you see that um, by um, uh, fitting, basically fitting a lot of uh, experimental data to uh, this curve mm, for materials with different compositions, it is possible to um, um, draw stress strain curves for um, ferritic steels hmm? uh, by deriving the A, B, and N parameters yeah? by inputting compositional data that you have, so, so silicon content, manganese content, phosphorus content, and uh, structural parameters such as the, the grain size. Hmm? Hmm? And so, you see, for instance, interesting things um, that as you uh, uh, increase the, um, the uh, so, 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 sorry, decrease the grain size, hmm, you have this um, whole patch effect. You will see an increase in A. Hmm, so this, the, the strength will go up. If you look at uh, the impact of grain size on the strain hardening, you see that uh, increasing the grains, decreasing the grain size results in an 
decrease in the uh, strain heart domain. Hmm? So grain size decrease, getting a smaller grain size will impact on strength, but positive impact on strength, negative impact on, on strain hardening. Okay? Um, and, um, and the B, the value of B here in this is actually the, uh, the strain uh, up to the elastic limit. Hmm? And, and so the elastic limit is 0.2%. Uh, right, so uh, you have uh, the same uh, type of equations are available for Perlite, Bainite, and Martensite. Hmm? Let's have a look here at the, um, the Perlite. The, the parameters that we, uh, that we find back here are uh, the um, interlamellar uh, size of the... Um, um, interlamellar size of interlamellar distance, excuse me, in the case of perlite, and F, the, uh, the, the volume fraction of, of cementite in the perlite. And, and so, for instance, the A value here increases as we decrease the interlamellar spacing and increase the amount of, per, uh, of uh, cementite in the perlite, as expected. In the case of martensite, what we see is that, uh, as, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, the most important factor uh, controlling the, uh, the strength of the uh, martensite is the carbon contact. Okay. Right, and so if you uh, use this kind of equations, you can um, uh, get an idea of the strength ranges that you can achieve with uh, ferritic, mainly ferritic micro microstructures, perlitic, bainitic, and martensitic uh, microstructures so using this, this swift equation. So it's very useful if you're doing exploratory uh, work on steel design. Um, in the case of um, uh, ferritic steels and perlitic steels, bainitic, martensitic steels, al although um, these are strictly not um, not necessarily homogeneous uh, uh, alloys. Um, they're pretty homogeneous on a mesoscale. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens if you have a, a steel where you you really have an appreciable volume fraction of second phase? Yes, uh, with rather different properties. Mm -hmm. Then um, what? Uh, and and uh, say, for instance, you have a phase alpha with a certain stress strain curve and a phase beta with another stress strain curve. Well, uh, if, if you have these two phases present in your steel, yes, it's a, a dual phase structure, uh, then you will measure a stress strain curve that's kind of in between, yes. And uh, in, uh, basically, um, the two extreme things can happen in the case of a um, a, um, a multi-phase steel is that uh, the strain, the macroscopic strain, is uh, the same in the macroscopic strain is equal to the strain in both phases. So in this case. I have an isostrain situation, yes, and um, the uh, higher uh, strength uh, material yeah, uh, takes up uh, all the, the stress, and the uh, lower strength material takes on less strength, less stress, excuse me. Uh, the other uh, alternative possibility is that we have an isostress situation, yes. And in this case, it's assumed that uh, the two phases are loaded in the same way, subject to the same stresses. And in this case, we see that the, uh, the softer material takes on uh, most of the, the deformation, hmm? whereas the strong material, the harder material, much less deformation, much less strain. 
So the, in, in the actual situation is somewhere in between, but it, as, a, as a rule, the, the harder phase uh, carries more load, yes, and the softer phase uh, uh, is, um, is subject to more uh, strain. And these are actual um, data, hmm? measurements of this stress and strain partitioning. In the case of a ferrite uh, cementite uh, mixture here, a steel, right? So you have cementite and ferrite, and you can see that uh, the cementite is extremely hard phase and basically doesn't deform uh, plastically, but if you look at the stress at any point on the stress strain curve, for instance, this point here, I use another pointer. Yeah. Yeah. This point here, yes, you can see that uh, the, the cementite is subject to very high elastic uh, stress deformation, yes and a very high stress, much lower stress in the case of the, of the ferrite, but there is a huge difference also in, uh, in the strain, right? The, uh, you have a considerable uh, plastic deformation in the ferrite, whereas the, the cementite is still elastically uh, in the elastic deformation, the elastic deform. Yeah? So this is an extreme case where I have a very hard phase and a very um, soft phase, ferrite and cementite. If we have uh, two phases uh, that can both deform, for instance, in the case of a duplex steel, duplex stainless steel, we basically have a microstructure yeah, where uh, about 50% of the volume consists of ferrite, Yes, of alpha ferrite, and 50% of the, uh, the grains consist of uh, gamma phase of, or austenite. Hmm? So in this case, uh, the stress strain curve for that particular austenite phase is shown here, and the stress strain curve for the ferrite phase is shown here. Right? So when we measure the stress strain curve of the duplex steel, yes, um, Stress and strain partitioning is such that the ferrite phase is subject to higher stress as lower strain, whereas the, the austenite is subject to lower stresses but higher plastic deformation. Hmm? So, okay. And so as a consequence, whenever you uh, add a, a hard phase to a um, to softer uh, ferrite matrix, um, you will get a, you can get a considerable increase in strength. Hmm? And uh, this is, for instance, exploited in the case of so-called DP steels. DP steel, DP stands for dual phase, yeah, DP steels, uh, which are a mixture of ferrite plus martensite. Hmm? Yeah. And, and we'll see how we, we can produce these steels. Hmm? And you can change the, the, the volume percent of uh, of uh, martensite in this duplex or dual phase steel. So the yield strength that you then get is linearly dependent on the amount of martensite you. So if you have a typical DP steel, will have about 10 percent of martensite, and you'll you'll reach. Um, Strength level of about uh, tensile strength level of about 600 megapascal. If you increase the uh, the amount of martensite to uh, a little over 20 percent, yes, you can increase the tensile strength to uh, 800 megapascal. So that is a way to achieve what is called structural strengthening of a steel by by basically using uh, different um, um, uh, mixing different phases basically by making a um, a composite that's the word I was looking for now up to now we uh, we, we have discussed a few times the the concept of uh, anisotropy hmm? um, 
and I want to um, come back to this um, to uh, make sure we um, all get uh, the um, understand the examples that we be, will be given um, later on in the lecture later on. So you know that uh, the uh, uh, yielding in uh, in mechanics is uh, is approached is very often approached uh, using what's called the, the von Mises yield criteria, mm -hmm. and that this uh, yield criteria can be uh, represented for any stress state uh, as a uh, uh, the surface of a uh, cylinder, yes, with a radius equal to square root times the uh, yield strength of the, the material we're looking at, we're studying, for instance, steel. Um, and, um, and all the stress states which fall within this cylindrical tube uh, will be elastic, and all the stress states on this, uh, on this tube, on the surface of the tube, or beyond that, are plastic deformation. Hmm? So now, uh, we are very much interested in a uh, situation where the steel is a, um, is a, a flat piece of, uh, flat sheet of material. So in that case, we are dealing with what's called a, a plain stress case. And uh, the, the yield surface then becomes uh, a yield curve, yes? Um, uh, which is given by the intersection of this cylindrical tube with this, uh, the surface uh, sigma three equals zero, yeah? and you get this. Uh, you get this intersection is a cylinder. Uh, sorry, the cylinder with uh, this plane is a is an ellipse, and uh, this ellipse is shown here. Hmm? The um, uh, uh, discussion is uh, still just of the, or the meaning of the of yield surface is still the same. Uh, any uh, uh, stress strait within this uh, ellipse is elastic, it gives elastic deformation. All stress strait outside here is are, are plastic. Hmm? Now, um, the effect of the R value, you remember the R value um, that we discussed earlier, the normal anisotropy, this factor that we're trying to get as high as possible to uh, improve the drawability of, the mit of, of a steel. Yes, the, um, An increase in this R factor results in the, the, the stretching of this uh, yield surface in, a, in the diagonal direction. Hmm? And it, uh, it means, for instance, that, for instance, if I have a, an R value of 2, hmm, the yield surface now here, yes, it means that if I had a biaxial uh, stress state, yes, um, an increase of the R value from R equal 1 to R equal 2, yes, will give me, for R equal 2, this stress trait was, uh, gave me plastic deformation. For R equal 2, the, the same stress trait is within, is within the ellipse, so the, uh, the material is il inelastically deformed. So, there's a, so um, because the R value is a result of an increase in the R value is, is, uh, is due uh, to texture control, the fact that um, the material, the, the, the yield strength increases yes, uh, when you increase R is called texture strengthening. So, uh, of course, this, uh, you will not observe this texture strengthening in all possible uh, cases. Hmm? No, obviously, you, you observe it very clearly in the biaxial uh, uh, test. The influence uh, 
in the case, for instance, of um, uh, on the strength in deep drawing, which is here, is very much smaller. Hmm? Okay, but so you also can strengthen material through strengthening. Right, and um, in this uh, graph, uh, we we can define, for instance, along this line here, uh, sigma in uh, x is equal to sigma y. So we call this any stress state along this line by axial balanced by axial. Um, a stress state where uh, sigma sigma y is zero. Yes, and so where you only have a sigma x that's non-zero, that's of course the tensile test. Hmm? And the case where uh, the uh, where where we are here, yes, is plane strain testing. Hmm? Okay, and you can actually measure this uh, yield locus by. Um, uh, looking at uh, the yielding of the material um, in, uh, in different stress states, and this is shown here, for instance, for structural steel, for uh, extra low carbon steel, and for IF steel. IF steel is the, the softest material, yes, uh, so it's got the, the smallest uh, yield um, uh, curve here, and then the uh, extra low carbon steel. Uh, and um, you see that the measurements are only for positive values of sigma x and sigma y. These are the easiest to, uh, to measure in practice. That's why the data is there and there's no data in the other directions. Yeah. It is also uh, possible uh, to say something about the, the stress not, uh, not only about the stress, but about the strains that uh, you get uh, during deformation. And that is based on a, um, a, a property that is called um, uh, normality in the, um, of the yield uh, curve, of the yield surface. Uh, what do we mean by this? Well. When a, uh, a uh, material, a steel, deforms, yes, the original uh, yield surface will move, yes, will move uh, and expand. Hmm? And so, because the uh, because the, f the flow stress has uh, is, is higher than the yield strength. Yeah? Okay, now. Uh, in this case, yes, the um, uh, uh, as shown here, the uh, we have a uniform expansion of this uh, of the uh, ellipse, yes, and uh, the uh, pr the principle of uh, normality. Uh, says that the uh, the strain yes is uh, perpendicular to the yield surface for all or any stress state. What does that mean? That means, for instance, that uh, it, when I uh, when I have a, a tensile test. Tensile test, sigma y, as I said previously, is equal to zero. Yeah? So I only have a sigma, a non-zero sigma x. So the stress state moves along this line. The uh, the uh, yield surface is here. It's this line here. Okay. Uh, when we uh, the stress is higher than the yield strength. Yes. Uh, the flow stress moves along the x-axis yes, and uh, moves, for instance, to this, uh, this point here. And this point is on the, uh, the new 
yield surface. But what's important to see is that the corresponding strains, yes, at this point here, are perpendicular to the yield surface. So even though there is a strain, a stress, excuse me, only along the x direction, the incremental strain in the y direction is non-zero. You can see uh, the, the strain, which is perpendicular to the uh, to this um, to the original yield surface, yes, has both an x component and a y component. So dy, the epsilon y, excuse me, is non-zero. Hmm? Um, another case, for instance, um, at this point here, yes. What, what are the, uh, the, the, the strains? Well, the normal to the uh, yield surface is, is this line here, is this vector here, excuse me. It is parallel to the x-axis. And in this case, d epsilon y, the elementary strain in the y direction is zero. You can see there's no y component in this case. And so that's why this point here is called the plane strain uh, a condition, deformation condition. Or so. And in this case here, I have dxy is equal to uh, d epsilon, d epsilon x is equal to d epsilon y. Hmm? Um, this is important here. Uh, this point here is important uh, because of the, um, uh, because it's related to the, 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 our well known uh, tensile test. The, uh, the strain along the x direction, that is the nothing, the d epsilon x, yes, that is along the strain along the length direction. And the d epsilon y is the strain along the width direction. So the, the ratio of d epsilon x to d epsilon y hmm, is related to our, our factor, hmm, our normal anisotropy in the following way. d epsilon x over d epsilon y is 1 minus r over r. Hmm. So um, the, uh, uh, there is an intimate relation between your yield uh, curve and uh, your uh, sheet properties. So these factors are not only interesting for um, uh, experts in uh, materials mechanics, there, there's also very practical experts, aspects to this R value to the N value, the strain hardening, and to the M value, the strain rate sensitivity. And we'll see a moment, uh, we'll say a few more things about strain rate sensitivity in a moment. Hmm? Why? Because whether or not you can uh, make uh, a panel, for instance, automotive panel, large automotive panel, uh, easily uh, and uh, ending up with a a panel that's defect free, yes, uh, will very much depend on these three uh, parameters. Hmm? Um, we um, uh, the the uh, what what is so complex about this part is the fact that the uh, the mode of deformation is very different in different positions. Hmm? And in order to illustrate that, uh, it's best to look at, for instance, a very simple, uh, deep drawn, uh, rectangular um, uh, uh, rectangular cup, if you want, yes, where the uh, the corners are said to deform in the deep drawing mode, the bottom in stretching mode and the sides in plane strain mode. Hmm? What does that mean? 
Well, if you look at the, uh, the strains, hmm, uh, the different parts undergo, yeah, um, you can uh, present uh, the uh, deformation on a graph hmm, uh, in the following way. Hmm. For instance, um, if you draw a nice little circle on the surface of the panel, of this panel, before you uh, deform it, before you deform it, you will find that these, this original circle, yes, will deform, will form an ellipse, yes, an el el elongated ellipse, yes, in this part of the panel. In the bottom part, yes, the uh, original circle, yeah, the original circle, will uh, become an expanded circle, yes. And on the sides here, on the sides here, the original circle will uh, become elliptical, yes. But in uh, in one of the directions, there will be no change in width. And these three uh, simple stages, uh, simple f f uh, um, modes of deformation are called, uh, so uh, in this case, deep drawing. Yes. Uh, here along this axis, plane strain. Yes. And on the right hand side, uh, uh, stretching. Stretching. Okay. And uh, the uh, the way the uh, this uh, this uh, uh, two dimensional uh, surface is um, uh, how should I say um, subdivided goes as follows. You call the uh, 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 this direction, the x direction, the uh, this x direction is the uh, the strain in the horizontal direction. So, uh, so in this case, hmm, you see the strain in the horizontal is zero. Right? Is zero. So, so we call the strain in this direction the minus strain, yeah? and um, it's zero here. Uh, on this side, you see that the strain in the x direction is positive, yes, and in the y direction is also positive. So uh, the strain direction, the strain in the x direction is is positive. In this situation, the deep drawing, the the strain is negative in the x direction because the circle, uh, um, uh, the width of the circle decreases and its length increases. Right, so. We have a, a, a minor strain, or the x strain, being negative. In the y direction, I always have a positive increase in in the strain. Now, it's always possible in uh, in two dimensions to um, to uh, put a, defo a, a, a state of deformation of a two-dimensional sheet on this diagram. Okay. And um, one of the things one finds is that um, that there are that there is a line called the forming limit diagram or the forming limit line, yes, yeah, which divides this uh, this surface in two pieces. Yes, if you are above this line. Yes, if you're above this line with your strain, it will lead to fracture. The deformation will lead to fracture. If you're below this line, this fracture uh, or the forming link diagram, this forming link, uh, your deformation is safe. That means it will not lead to, uh, to cracking. Hmm? All right. So um, this is an example here. Of, of the way uh, you, you do these measurements. You actually um, do measure the strains experimentally. 
uh, four specific uh, types of deformation. Hmm? So for instance here, uh, our origin, this is a, a biaxial deformation situation. Uh, you have an originally square grid on uh, this, uh, in this sheet, and then you expand it, you form a dome, yes, uh, uh, by exerting pressure here below with a, a punch, yes, and, uh, and the material deforms, flows uh, around this punch. Hmm? And you can measure the stresses, excuse me, you can measure the strains, yes, uh, by measuring the change in the dimensions of the uh, of the square. Hmm? Uh, this is a simple uh, case, uh, a simple biaxial, so-called bi balanced biaxial situation where the uh, the two uh, principal stresses are, are equal. Uh, it's not the same in, um, uh, when you uh, draw a cup, whether it's a cylindrical cup or a rectangular uh, pot, say, um, you, you have very different uh, stress states. Um, in the bottom, you have a balanced biaxial situation. In the uh, wall, you, uh, the, uh, the wall is subject to uh, also uh, stretching, but it's the, the, the stresses are not equal, yes? And uh, in the flange, you have compression in the, uh, uh, the thickness direction and uh, compression in the, uh, in the circumferential direction. Okay. Now, um, when we generally don't measure the, the R value uh, by um, a cup test. In general, we do measure it by looking at the, the ratio of the width strain and the thickness strain in a uh, tensile test, yes? You also already know that uh, this R value is not uh, constant, but uh, in the plane of uh, sheet steel, it can vary. Yes, and it, it's also the uh, 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 and and this anisotropy is also a function of uh, the amount of deformation you give. Hmm? For instance, um, so so for, for you remember that uh, as I said earlier, there is a uh, the R, the fact that the R value varies with direction uh, gives rise to earring. Yes. Uh, this earring, uh, the height of these ears, decreases with the amount of cold rolling, yes? But if you go beyond a certain uh, point, which is somewhere 70 to 80 percent of uh, cold deformation for low carbon steel or F steels, you get an increase in the anisotropy again, yes? And that gives rise to uh, increased earring again. Hmm? The, uh, the value of R is uh, very much related to the, how deep a cup you can make. The higher the R value, the deeper a cup you can make, yes? And the delta R value is related to the presence of ears, yes? And that's a simple way of putting it. The n value now. The n value, why is uh, it important to have a high n value? Well, um, first of all, I should say, uh, if I may go back to the, um, uh, the uh, FLD curve here, the minimum here of this, this FLD curve is uh, pretty much determined by the strain hardening. So the, the, the higher your strain hardening is, the higher your FLD curve will be. So that's, a, that's already a good point. The other thing is that when you make a, for instance, a, 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 a biaxial deformation, 
so uh, stretch forming operation. The the end value, uh, the end value, the strain hardening. Uh, if your strain hardening uh, is low, you will get a strain, a thickness uh, strain, which will tend to um, very quickly uh, localize, uh, giving uh, risk for fracture. When you increase the strain hardening, you get a thickness strain that is a lot more homogeneously distributed. And the reason is very simple. Um, the, if you have a high uh, strain hardening uh, factor, if there is a little bit of uh, uh, local, uh, locally higher s strain, thickness strain, uh, the material will strengthen, yes, and, and the deformation will stop there. And, 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 and you will get, end up having a nice distribution of the thickness strain. So a good way to avoid um, a fracture or rupture in stretch forming is to have a high uh, strain hardening value. Okay? And although uh, we, um, we do say that the, the end value is uh, uh, a factor uh, uh, that is strain dependent, uh, the, um, the usefulness of the, um, of the factor is shown here from an engineering point of view. This shows a num uh, for two uh, uh, st structurally strengthened uh, materials, two trip steels. We show the uh, natural logarithm of the uh, stress versus natural logarithm of the strain. And you see that over relatively large uh, strain range, n value, uh, the idea that you have a constant n value is, is um, acceptable. The important thing, uh, one of the imp uh, important things that I wanted to, to mention is that for ferritic steels, the n value is typically of the order of 0.2 most of the time to 0.25 in good, in good situations. There is not much we can do about the strain hardening in, um, in uh, steels with a ferritic matrix um, without changing the, the microstructure, without going towards a multi-phase microstructure. Um, it, it's in contrast to uh, the R value, which we can indeed uh, uh, influence by influencing the texture. Um, right. Uh, what is important with um, the uh, uh, the um, the n value is um, the fact that uh, it is grain size dependent. Mm -hmm. um, when you increase the um, uh, decrease, excuse me, the grain size, yes, yes, you increase the strength of the material, yes, without really increasing or influencing the strain hardening. And as a consequence, you know, so you, you, you increase the curve here, but the uniform elongation is determined by the intersection of the stress-strain curve and the derivative to the stress-strain curve, the strain hardening. And you can see that if that doesn't increase, yes, um, I, I end up with a much lower uniform elongation. Hmm? So in general, um, the uh, increasing in uh, of the the strength of steels, um, res and certainly when you we use uh, grain refinement as a way to to refine uh, to increase the strength, leads to uh, a reduction in uniform elongation. What we can also say is that 
uh, certainly when it comes to conventional steel grades, as we increase the strength of the steel grades, yes, uh, we see a drop in the um, uh, uh, the N value in the strain hardening. This is shown here for a large number of steels. You see that the N value uh, decreases as we increase the tensile uh, strength. But let's have a look at um, what the, uh, for instance, what, what could be a, a possible explanation. For instance, if we look here at the, the low values, the very low values here of the N, val of the, uh, N value, we see that the um, inverted uh, triangles like, are all here. Okay, and uh, that corresponds to the niobium HSLA steels. Okay, and, and here we can already see that uh, the reason, or guess, that the reason why we have such a low um, N value, strain hardening value, is actually due to the fact that we have a finer grain size. So engineering the uh, so the lowest N values, as I said, are for HSLA steels, which are which are strengthened by uh, grain size refinement. Okay. So engineering the uh, uh, the strain hardening is uh, in steels is actually uh, a very difficult thing to do, and is um, a very active area of research uh, in uh, in steel science the last, uh, in the last, has been a very active area of research in the last few years. Um, another important thing is the M value. What is the M value? Well, um, the M value is uh, the strain uh, rate sensitivity of the mechanical property. So uh, this is an example here of what happens when I measure the flow stress of a steel. So th this is the stress. So it's, it's I'm, I'm basically somewhere on this, the, the stress-strain curve, stress, strain, yes. And uh, so I'm nicely measuring the stress-strain curve at a certain strain rate, epsilon one dot, yes. And I suddenly change the strain rate to a higher value, yes. What do I see is I, I see uh, uh, an increase in the... Uh, the stress and the flow stress, which which uh, reduces so the instantaneous value is reduced a little bit, but eventually I end up with a increase in the flow stress as a consequence of this increase in the uh, strain rate. Hmm? So, the this is an interesting property: um, strain rate sensitivity. Why is it an interesting property, and why? do we want to have this uh, factor uh, high, high value of strain rate sensitivity? Well, when you are past the uniform elongation, so you've reached the point of instability and the material starts to neck, so that means the uh, plastic deformation starts to be localized. When that happens, it means that all the deformation is localized in the neck region. Yes? There is no more deformation in the regions uh, beyond the neck. Yeah? They, stopped, uh, they stopped deforming. All the deformation, plastic deformation is in the neck. And because of that, the strain rate is changing also. The, the, rate, the, the, the strain rate is changing, is increasing in the uh, in the neck region. And as this happens, yes, the resistance to fracture, yes, in the neck will increase, yes, the higher my M value is. 